Hi, and welcome to Visual Studio Toolbox. I'm your host, Robert Green, and joining me today is Andrew Hall. Hey, Andrew. Hi, Robert. Welcome back on the show. Thank you. You've been on the show a number of times. I have. Uh, doing episodes on debugging mostly. Yeah. But now you have a, you have a new job. You're with a new team. I Tell am, yeah. About that. Uh, yeah, so I moved to the uh, web development tools team. So we do uh, all of the tooling for ASP.NET, the web editors, mm -hmm. so HTML, CSS, JSON. And then we uh, also build tools for Azure App Service. Cool. So we're going to talk today about the tools inside Visual Studio for doing Azure Functions. Yeah. And Azure Functions is very interesting. Uh, I know it's been covered on other shows like Cloud Cover, um, but you're going to show us tools for doing them. I am. But let's start with a review of what are Azure Functions and why are we interested in them. Yeah, so Azure Functions are often called serverless computing. And it's the idea... Which is ironic since they run on a server somewhere else. It, it is, and I'll explain <laughs> what, that, what that means. But the, the reason it's called serverless computing is you don't have a dedicated process that's up and running. And so the idea is that it's event-driven. Mm -hmm. And the function only runs and only consumes resources on the server when it actually has an event to respond to. So you can do an HTTP trigger, which would be a traditional, generally how you interact with like an ASP.NET app yeah. or something like that. But there's tons of other uh, events that we'll talk about. You can respond to things being put into queues and blob storage. And you, know, you can wire up uh, to listen to when things change in GitHub or things like that. So the idea is you can, they kind of the, are the glue that stitch other things together. So it's kind of cool because in, cloud computing, there are things happening on the cloud. Like you mentioned, something goes into blob storage, which is an event that happens in the cloud, and Azure Functions give you a way of hooking into those events, right? Correct. Cool. Yeah, so it's, and as I said, it's, and the idea then is you only actually pay for the resources that you're using right. while your code is running. Right. So Azure Functions, basically, they charge you by the hundreds of milliseconds that your, your application's running for. Cool. As opposed to normally if you wanted to do something with a, uh, you know, if you had to think of like a normal like ASP.NET process or something like that, mm -hmm. and you want it to be able to scale and always be available, it's basically up there and always, always running. So you're sort of right. paying for some, and you can have it scale up or scale down, but you always have some amount of code that's taking up server resources and available at all times. Yep. So you want to write some code that uh, is triggered when somebody adds a picture or a document, it's a file storage as an example. So, you know, maybe uh, somebody in the field is taking a photograph of something, you know, whether it's an, an adjuster goes out and looks at your vehicle, uploads photos, and at that point, some process kicks off. Um, but rather than, as you said, sitting there constantly spinning the meter or, you know, writing some file watcher type thing that is constantly querying, there's an event that gets triggered, and then you get to write code on that. Correct, yeah, so I think, let's pick your adjuster example, because that's a great example. You have an insurance adjuster that goes out, they fill out a report, they take some pictures, they upload it. Mm -hmm. So now what a function can do is you can look for the presence of something changing on a blob storage uh, location, mm -hmm. and you can say, okay, whenever something goes into this, let me know. The function code is just going to pick that up, and it's going to put the images in the right place. It may process the form that they uploaded, stick that information in a database, and then the function goes away. Send out notifications, do any and, number of things. And so when someone runs the nightly report, what they're, it, like all that information is just there and ready. So right. instead of having to do it as a batch job where you say every you know, an hour we're going to pick up and look for stuff, right. you can just do, process them nicely on demand. It's always there. You don't have weird refresh problems. You don't make people on the other end wait because, you know, so either you write, if you think about, if you can't do it based on the event, you have to have it on some sort of, sort of cadence. So right. you might say, twice a day. Well, that means if somebody goes and runs a report at 11 a.m. and yep. you run it at noon and 5 p.m., it's out of date. Right. Or if you go say, look for stuff in the queue and process it, when they go run that report, it's not going to take them right. longer to run that report. Or if you're waiting for something, you don't have to now go look for it every five minutes to see if it's there. You can be told when it's there. Exactly. So, you know, uh, Azure Functions, they have a lot of great input and output uh, things. So you could say, hey, like when I finish processing this, I'm going to send an email right. to the relevant party. Yep. So maybe one of the fields in that report that the, the adjuster uploads is uh, the email address that the person on the other end, the back end, that needs to know when that's available. Yep. So the Azure function processes the information, puts it in the database, and the last task it does is actually sends an email that says, hey, this information is now available. Cool. 
Now, most of the demos I've seen of Azure Functions, you actually write the code in the portal, Correct. which is cool, of course. Uh, nothing wrong with that. <laughs> nothing wrong with writing code outside of Visual Studio. But for those of us that want to write our code inside Visual Studio, uh, that's what you're going to show us right that, now. That's what I'm going to show you, yeah. So, cool. I mean, I think the, the feedback that we've heard is the portal's great for getting up and getting started really quickly. But I think most of us that have done development for a while realize that as soon as you want to start building up meaningful amounts of code that you're stitching together, mm -hmm. uh, working in an IDE like Visual Studio right. is going to be much more productive. Plus the context switch, right? right. If you're context. writing the rest of the app, why do I have to switch over to the portal to write a piece of the functionality of the app and come all the way back into Visual Studio? And here's the million dollar question, Robert. How do you debug it in the portal? That is a good question. I, I, I predict we're going to find out how I would debug it in Visual Studio. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good prediction. <laughs> Something about my past life, maybe. <laughs> All right, so uh, I want to point out before I get going here that uh, the tooling we have today is a preview and it's available only for Visual Studio 2015 okay. as a separate download. And so you can go to our uh, blog, so my web developer blog, so it's blogs.msdn.com slash webdev, and then you'll find near the top my um, post on Visual Studio Tools for Azure Functions. This has the instructions for how to, well, everything that you need. So basically you need Visual Studio 2015 Update 3. Yep. Makes sense. Uh, the Azure SDK 2.9.6, which is okay. the most recent version of the or Azure later. SDK. Or later. And then you need to download and install our preview tooling on top of that, which is okay. what this link is right here. So, you know, if you're already doing Azure development, you probably already have these two out of the yep. way. Um, and then you just need to download and install our, our basically preview bits. Or on if top you of that. automatically install anything, Visual Studio tells you to. Yeah, that, we won't, aren't going to automatically shows, install the Azure SDK the unless, you, unless you're working with Azure. Right. We don't recommend that you install the Azure SDK for the sake of yeah, it. Yeah, but if you install it ever, then you'll get a notification that tells you there's a new version of correct. it. Correct. So That's correct, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so that's, that's so you, worth calling out. So you're not going to yeah. go to visual, uh, vanilla Visual Studio 2013 Update 3, sorry, 2015 Update 3, and find what I'm about to show you. Right. You're not even going to install the most recent Azure SDK and find what I'm about to show you. You actually then have to also go install the special preview tools on top of that. Okay, well, uh, in 2017, what's the story? Yeah, so the preview right now exists for Visual Studio 2015 only. Uh, you know, we're working on Visual Studio 2017 right now. We are in the RC phase mm -hmm. of that. Uh, functions tooling um, that's not a preview um, isn't going to be available in 2017 when we ship the RTM product. Okay. It will come sometime after right. that. And we will not take the preview label off of it until it works in 2017. Um, but the reality is just with, you know, do few things and do them well. So as a team right now, we're really focused on finishing 2017 at a high quality, especially okay. uh, finishing the tools for .NET Core. Right. And so once we finish that, once we ship that, we'll be able to go and dedicate um, our focus on getting Azure Functions tooling up to, up to snuff and ready okay. into a V1 state. All right, so I'm in the new project dialog. And under the cloud node here, under C Sharp, I can pick the Azure Functions, and notice it has a preview label on it. And so let's go ahead and just call this, uh, how about toolbox function app? Okay. Toolbox uh, functions. All right, so we're going to go ahead and create our new project. Take a couple seconds. And you notice that as this comes up, I'm going to have a uh, sort of a vanilla project here with a two, couple files in it. And so I have app settings.json. This is where I'm going to stick uh, information, that configuration data that my application is going to use, like um, the connection string. So for example, every function type except for a HTTP trigger is required to have a storage account associated with it. Okay. Um, and then this <coughs> Azure Web Jobs dashboard, this is not actually a particularly interesting moment. This just tells it where to pipe log output. So if I'm running locally, um, it would then show up in the portal anyway. I don't really need that. So, okay. But when we eventually want to connect up to like a blob storage or a queue or something like that, we're going to go ahead and put the connection string here in this Azure Web Jobs storage. And then whenever we create functions, we will actually just give it the name of the key here. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and copy this because we'll create a function in a second. Okay. And then we have host.json, which is a blank JSON file right now, um, but we can use it to configure properties about how the functions behave, and we'll show an example of that in a minute. So let's go ahead and get started. I'm going to right click and I'm going to say add 
new Azure function, so it's a special item type today. And you can see that anything that you can do in the portal from a language perspective, we support in Visual Studio. Mm. I will mention though including that... Including Bash. Including Bash. <laughs> Which is command line stuff, right? Uh, yeah, that's uh, generally... Uh, okay, cool. Yep. Um, but so we're going to go ahead and focus on C Sharp today, so we'll filter this list just to that. And I'll mention most of the stuff that I'm going to show you in, in Visual Studio. But like you can create, you can edit, depending on what you have installed. We'll dictate mm -hmm. whether you get IntelliSense or not. Um, but obviously, we're going to get IntelliSense for C Sharp pretty much no matter what. As soon as um, in Visual Studio 2015, C Sharp's always installed. And uh, debugging only works on uh, C Sharp functions today. Okay. Um, so let's go ahead and let's go ahead and create a queue trigger because it really demonstrates everything we want to talk about in a nice lightweight fashion. Um, so I have an Azure uh, storage account open here already, and so I have a queue that's called my queue test. So let's go ahead and say the name of the queue is going to be my queue test. Remember I mentioned that key value pair here yep. for a second. So Azure Web Job Storage. That's the name name of the key that's going to okay. contain the that's connection string. That's not the string. actual connection string. That's the Correct. Name of the key it's the name of the going key to that's going to contain the Got connection it. string. That's good to know. And that's so I can share. Um, we'll talk about the structure a little bit more after I generate this, but that's so I can share connection strings across multiple functions because mm, okay. the way they work today. Yep. So Q trigger C sharp. Um, that's good enough for now. Let's go ahead and say create. And so you can see I get a folder here that's dedicated to the function that I just created. So you can have multiple functions in the same solution. Correct. So you can have as many functions right. as you want. If you wanted, you could have a JavaScript function, you could have a C sharp function, you can have F sharp sure, function. They can all exist happily in the in the same uh, same solution today. Let's go ahead and close the properties here. And so what I have here is I have uh, function.json. This is um, I just want to open you. There you go. I tried to drag it apparently instead of double clicking it. Um, this is going to contain some information that we entered in the portal. So this tells the runtime how to bind the uh, the function entry points. So the name, that's a pretty self-explanatory. Mm -hmm. The type, what type of what are we listening to? It's a queue trigger. Um, and then from a param, and then we have uh, my queue test. So this is the name of the queue. And then this is I mentioned we had uh, this is the name of the key that's going to ultimately right. contain the connection string. And the reason for that is if you think about and if I put the connection string in here every time. If I then, like when I moved from, for example, test to production, I might have to go update the connection string in like 20 or 30 different functions. Right. But by simply all pointing it at the same key, I only have to update it once. Yep. And so today it's blank, so this isn't going to work. So let's go here to Azure Storage Explorer, and let's go up to this particular storage account. Let's go ahead and grab our connection string. And when we come back to Visual Studio, we'll go ahead and paste that in. Perfect. So that connection string should work now. And so uh, you can see I don't my uh, function at the moment, it's in this container, this run.csx file. It doesn't do anything particularly interesting at the moment. Just lets but you know that it ran. It's gonna print something to the log. Mm -hmm. So it's gonna go ahead, let's go ahead and hit F5 and just uh, watch it, watch it run, see if it's gonna work as we would expect. So I'm gonna see that, the, that this uh, command line is gonna come up. This is the function's runtime. And so these are dynamically compiled currently. So if I had any compilation errors, which hopefully I don't, because it's just mm -hmm. a vanilla template, uh, I would expect to see those here. And it's going to tell me that the uh, job host has started, and so we're waiting for something to happen. Oh, so I forgot one thing. I mentioned the host.json. So by default, a lot of these things in Azure, they don't necessarily, there's a time period for how often they actually check for updates before they would get triggered. So at the moment, um, it's going to be the default behavior for the queue is it's going to check once a minute. So okay. what I want to actually do is I want to come in here and I want to update it to say let's check once a second so we don't have to wait for a minute. It's kind of dead air time, right? Right. So the, the nice thing is uh, we have IntelliSense for this. So I think uh, I'm doing queues, so let's do that. And then I want to uh, go ahead down here and I want to say max polling interval. And let's do 1,000, so this is a millisecond. So that should change our max polling interval to okay. once, once a second instead of once a minute. All right, it's going to come up and run. Perfect. Now, if I, we did everything correctly, I should be able to go push something into this queue, a message. And let me go ahead and add something. Let's say, hi, toolbox. Let's click OK. And now when I go back here to watch my, um, I can see that it's going to tell me that the C-sharp queue trigger function processed hi, yeah, toolbox. Cool. So 
we've actually just connected up. And I want mm -hmm. to point out, I'm using Azure Storage Explorer. This is nothing running locally. I'm actually working against a real Azure Storage account in the cloud. Right. But I'm, I'm running everything locally. And now, this is going back to our question before, and this is one of the things you can't do in the portal today. What if I want to debug this? Hmm. So notice my breakpoint bound. That's a good sign. Let's go ahead uh, back to Storage Explorer. Let's add another one. Let's call it uh, breakpoint is going to be my message. And back here in Visual Studio, I can see that the breakpoint hit. Cool. And so I'm doing regular debugging. So I'm going to hit F10. I'm going to step. I can step. I can use the debugger to inspect my variable values. So as I'm developing these things, I can actually run, test, and debug them locally it's using the Visual Studio tools in a also, really tight loop. Sorry. But no, you finish. <laughs> oh, I say where if, if I'm doing writing code in the portal, not only am I am I using the portal editor, which is actually a pretty good editor. They have some IntelliSense and stuff like that. But um, if I want to debug, I'm relying predominantly on logging. Right. So I'm doing this uh, basically what I have here, log.info, right? I call it printf debugging or console.write debugging. So that's kind of what you're forced to do up in the cloud. Um, or you can remote debug it from Visual yeah. Studio. But cool. And then it would be easier to put this into source control, these functions into source control, doing it inside Visual Studio, presumably? Absolutely, because it's just a, a regular function right. project. And so functions are fully integrated with the Azure Kudu system. And so you can hook it up for continuous integration. So you can just edit in Visual Studio. Mm -hmm. And we have two ways of deploying them to the cloud. I'll show the web deploy here in a second. So I can right click on this and say uh, publish, and I can publish my functions that way. Or if I hook up continuous integration uh, going through a Git repository, either using VSTS or GitHub or multiple other uh, source control systems, yep. I can make changes, I can just check it in, and then it'll automatically be continuously deployed um, into production for me. Cool. No manual step required. Um, but let's go ahead and, and, and publish this up to the cloud right now. And so say publish. So I'm going to publish it to Microsoft Azure App Service. Let's go ahead and create a new resource group just for the purpose of this to make it nice and easy. So the web app name, uh, toolbot functions, probably good enough. Um, Azure resource group, let's create another one just for us. Um, central. Let's go ahead and go with a, um, a new app service plan. I'll talk about these in a second. So this is the idea of what size machine do I want to run these on or the, the recommend, really the way that we, I would probably recommend, which one of the cool things about functions is called a consumption plan. And so what a consumption plan is, is it's the idea that you're only going to run the function, um, you're only going to pay for what you use. Like okay. you're not going to have a dedicated sort of VM up there and running like you are with these other ones. It's like you say, hey, if we're not, you're not, none of these are being hit, they're never going to be run, you have no dedicated resources associated with them, but then you, you can scale them up to, to as much scale as they need, and you can go in and set some limits on like, yeah, scale them as much as needed, but I don't want to pay more than $50 a month or whatever. Now, does that impact startup time or anything? What, what's the downside of doing consumption versus those other plans? That's a, a good, I think the downside of the, of the consumption plan is more of the, you have to go in and manually configure um, spending limits, or okay. you could end up with a really, really big bill. Uh, okay. Where yeah. the, uh, and then if you basically say, so these you pay for the size of the dedicated machine mm -hmm. of that you're basically, you're running your functions on. Um, if you're in a consumption plan, you're not paying when you're not using them, but if you, you either could pay a really, an infinite bill, like these will just keep turning away, and you may, like, they may take a lot longer, okay. but um, eventually like it'll process through everything in the queue. With a consumption plan, it will basically infinitely scale unless you set a price limit on it, but once you hit the price limit, you stop processing right. for that month. Okay. Does that make sense? Yep. So it's really a, I don't know if the risk reward is quite, quite the right way to talk about it, but do you want to sort of be able to infinitely scale, but if you go set a price cap, now you're going to potentially stop processing okay. stuff if you ever hit that. Got it. Whereas these, it's sort of like, if you think about my laptop here, well, it's just going to continually run, and it's going to churn through things as fast as it can. It's not going to scale well, but I also have a fixed cost, and it's just going to keep chugging on things. All right. Um, let's go ahead with the consumption plan. Um, I'm going to go ahead. I'm here in the uh, West U.S. Let's go ahead and put in the West U.S. Let's say OK. Let's pick a storage account. Uh, why does it not... Um why are you not happy? The name can only contain lowercase letters. All right. 
go ahead and create that. These are preview bits. These are preview bits. That's correct. Although I vaguely remember that that bug with the uh, the, the lowercase versus the, um, thing. I think it was actually an issue on the Azure side. Yeah. Oh. Like they they wouldn't accept uh, uppercase letters for some reason. Just I guess calling too lower was hard. I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> you called too lower. No, you called too lower. Um, well, it's always just dangerous to change what people type in. Yeah. I guess. Well, some things are case sensitive, some things are not. But you know, changing someone's case without them knowing it could always, I'm guessing, could you know, result in a bad uh, something bad happening. All right, so we now have it. So let's go ahead and click publish. So this should take about I don't know, 10, 15 seconds or so. Mm -hmm. Any questions while we're going? So you're now publishing this to Azure. Uh, before you were running it, running it locally or running it in Azure? No, so before I was running the function locally. Locally, okay. Yeah, and so what I just did is we published it to Azure. Yep. And so now if I go to the portal, I would expect to see, so let's go to resource groups. I created my new resource group called Toolbox. And I can see that I have a function app in here. Mm -hmm. And once that loads, we should see our Q C sharp trigger, and I can and see sure the code, enough, that's my which code. you could edit here, and which I could edit here would get automatically updated in Visual Studio. No, when you would not get over. automatically no? updated in oh, Visual okay. Studio. So if I make any edits here, unless I manually brought them back to Visual Studio, they're going to get overridden the next time I publish. Oh, okay. So, so my actually, so um, the, the one, basically once you're in Visual Studio, Visual Studio becomes a source of truth if you choose to publish. Okay. And actually, if you hook it up to uh, the continuous integration that I mentioned using uh, Git source control, it actually won't let you edit in the portal. It's a read-only view. Okay. And it will say, like, this is, you know, coming from source control. Like, we don't have the ability to push changes back to source control. Um, let's go ahead and open up the logs. So I mentioned, so we would expect um, we're connected to the streaming log service. So for mm -hmm. now, I would expect that if I go push something into my queue, it's going to work in the portal. So let's go ahead and refresh. Da, 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 da. I would expect the breakpoint message to be gone because we processed it before when we hit the breakpoint. And so let's call this um, should show in portal. OK. And if I go up here to, to back to my portal, uh, it should, uh, should get processed here at some point. So maybe I have to click the refresh. Uh, or am I still running locally? That could always happen too. Yeah, how does this know? All right, so they should be, everything should be queuing off the same thing. So let's try this again. Okay, it's possible I have also have a, some previous function I created that's actually queued up to this. Um, that happens sometimes because I didn't create a new dedicated, uh, so it's basically the first, first person to, to check the queue and, and to process it, process it wins. Um, so that's going to be my Yes, that's what's happening. I guess the other question is we go to our app settings and see if, uh, remember these are preview bits, so it's possible our connection string didn't get, uh, didn't, didn't get passed in correctly. So let's go ahead and let this finish. Um, and Azure Web Job Storage, that should have gotten picked up correctly. That looks probably right, but let's go ahead and, and back to Visual Studio and double check. Um, where's my app settings in JSON? Oh nope, that doesn't look like the same uh, the same connection string. So, mm. so that's actually must be my issue. I mentioned these are preview bits. In theory, uh, when we do stuff in ASP.NET, we try to pick up stuff from your app settings and set the connection string appropriately. But I guess in this case, it got connected to the. Um, so let's go ahead and just update this. Perfect. Boom. Let's save that change. Perfect. So I can see that I have still have some messages in the portal. And I'm guessing with that change, it should pick up and start processing these. So let's go ahead and close view. Um, let's go back to my function. And once the logs, streaming logs get up and connected. Should probably just take a second to pick up those changes. See if 
I may have, uh, oh, you know what I just did? I re sorry, I broke myself here. <laughs> I, uh, because I, 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 put the, I connected the storage queue up to a different one than the source code was stored on. So it's now saying like, hey, you changed the, the, the storage location that you're putting me in. You should be um, like, I can't, uh, I can't access the source code because the source code for oh. it actually gets stored in the storage account. So sorry, that was my bad. Let's go actually just reuse the same storage account that we're using over here. So this is function ACBA. So now in Visual Studio, let's go ahead and create a new publish profile. So let's say publish. Let's go create a new profile. Um, uh, we can go ahead and use our, to our toolbox resource group. Uh, let's go ahead and say new. Uh, let's go ahead and say Y should mean dynamic. Uh, and then storage account, let's go with the function ACBA. So this is the same one oh, I'm pointing you, off to off the queue. Okay, so you chose the wrong storage account when you published. I did, or I, could, right. I, or I could have added a different key. So the okay. problem is, is like I changed what, like this is, this, yes. this value here is actually, uh, sorry, I'm, this is covering it, but the that Azure function storage is where it's going to store the source code, and I could have right. added a different key and pointed at a different um, different storage account. But by okay. going in and changing it in the portal, I then actually screwed up uh, where, like again, it's like I can't find the source code. So okay, okay. so this should finish fix it. Let's republish. Well, that's good. One of the things I love doing on this show is is showing what it's like in real life to use these things. <laughs> if you come in here and it's a perfectly polished demo, my first thought is okay, right. <laughs> that doesn't happen in the real world. Well, what would it look like in the real world? So now we're seeing that. Yeah, so That's good. Uh, like I said, so what I could have done here alternately is I could have said like, uh, sorry, I need a comma here, but I could have said like Q connection. And then yeah, I, oh, deployment failed. Uh-oh. Um, Well, using specified process because the process web is started on the remote server. Now let's just try it again. Let's see what happens. Um, profile. Looks like the most more recent one. All right, let's do what happens again. If not, we'll go with this uh, this route here. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right, work that time. Sometimes, sometimes yeah. these things fail. Right. So now, if I come back here, let's go ahead and refresh. Maybe just close this out. Um, let's go ahead into our toolbox. So that's the resource group that we used. And so this looks like the one that we j probably just published. Mm -hmm. We created a new app because I forgot to, I didn't reuse the app name. So, so I created a new instance of it. Perfect. C sharp triggers there. Go ahead and look at our logs. Ah, here we go. And then now it worked correctly. So we can yeah, say that okay. it's it processed the process the messages. So cool. Does that make did, did I explain yes. myself well enough what yes. I screwed up? Yep. Okay. All right. So now we actually see it running in the portal. So we did it Visual Studio local. So we it's, were able it's to run a, debug locally. A nice tip and trick for when working with Azure is don't accept the names that it gives you with all those numbers. <laughs> Yes. Use your own name so you can keep track of what's what. <laughs> yeah, and the reason it gives you those sort of crazy, crazy numbers is because this is actually a public endpoint. Right, that it has anybody to be unique. Because I didn't right. add any authentication yep. to it. And so, yeah, it has to be unique within the Azure yes. system. And the easiest way to do that is just add a bunch of random numbers at the end. Correct. Which is great as a default, but then it confuses you when you're looking at, at your own stuff. Correct. It's okay. fine if you have one. <laughs> you have more than that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> which one did I? Which one did I actually do? Right. Uh, so last thing I want to show is so I showed doing this to the portal. So let's say this because this happens sometimes, right? So let's say I had the wrong connection string or something mm -hmm. like that. Um, I get it up here and it was getting triggered, but it wasn't behaving quite like I expected. Um, so if I can go back to Visual Studio, I can go to Cloud Explorer, and I'm gonna go ahead and just pin this here. This should uh, come up, and so I can go down here and I can look at my App services. Go ahead and collapse this, and I can see the function apps that I just created. Mm -hmm. So this is the one we're currently on, and I can right-click on this, and I can debug it. Ooh. 
So let's go ahead and say attach debugger. I can come back here to my run.csx. Let's go ahead and unpin this for a second. And this is so you can debug the version running in Azure as opposed to the version running locally. Correct. Because I, I have had it when I've been uh, writing some of these. You know, you, everything, anybody that's ever done server development runs into this. It runs great on your machine. Yes. For some reason, when you publish it up, you know, to the test server yes. or something that's not your machine, it's not working quite right. Right. And uh, so what remote debugging I've lets heard you of do, that. You have. I've, I've heard of that happening. It's never yes. happened to you. It's a, I, I think it's an urban, urban legend, personally. But I know people who swear by it. All right. So it looks like... And, and I mentioned before, right, the ability to run and debug locally is, is really valuable because while we offer the ability to, to remote debug, mm -hmm. you can see that, you know, we're dealing with the cloud and so there's a lot of latency that can actually be involved in that. Um, so the, the risk of dynamic, so I realize as, you know, I, as I say this that um, I may be in a, in a world where um, I could get myself in trouble, is you can get switched back and forth between machines. So a dedicated uh, VM, going back to that question, why did my code go away? Um, something weird happened. Ooh. Don't know why uh, that would have made it disappear. That's weird. That is very odd. These are preview bits, so the remote debugging should not... Um, yeah, is that... Should not have, uh, so something weird went on there. Uh, as you mentioned, this is a real life show and I have no <laughs> explanation for that because huh. my code just went away. Um, that may be a bug we just found live oh, on the air. Cool. Um, so in theory, what should have happened, and it's always worked before for me, is you should, I should have been able to just right click, I should have been able to say attach debugger, and then I should have had that, that breakpoint bind and hit. So let's go here, I can browse my files through here. So this is, um, Toolbox functions this. I can go here and I can say files. And it's unable to receive, yeah, which makes sense because it's basically telling us that there's yeah. no there's no files. Board. I have no idea what happened, Robert. I am as confused well, I guess as we won't be showing that. But it's in there. It's in there. And it should and, work. Well, apparently we now know that until we get whatever that just happened. Well, it did fixed. work. To full disclosure, we're, we, re we redid this episode because... The first time we did this, neither of us was really happy with it. <laughs> and it worked then, right? That's correct, okay, yeah. So. All right, so let's go ahead up here. Let's just say publish. I don't need the preview to, to populate itself. So let's try this one more time, just because I'm stubborn and I refuse to accept <laughs> failure. All right, so it's up there. So if I go back to the portal, and I go back here, and I click this one, we see... Source code okay, there. Good. All right, let's refresh. Still there. That's good. Awesome. So let's go back to, to Visual Studio. Let's go back to Cloud Explorer. Uh, well, that's not going to... There, there is actually refresh? a bug in Cloud Explorer right now. We fixed it for the next version, but it's not, not yet in this particular thing. So let's go ahead and say attach debugger. Let's see what happens. So as I mentioned, debugging is going to only be reliable when you create a dedicated machine. I so said the, the, the interesting thing about dynamic is because it scales, it can hop around between instances and Azure. Okay. So I don't know if we exposed a bug related to that, but it's always possible that you'll never hit your breakpoint. It's possible. It's not likely. Oh. But it's possible that if the function's under load, you could attach to instance A, and if I go push something into the queue, it could get processed by instance B. All right, so let's see. Let's go ahead and refresh this. And, and that's, only, right. that's only something under that plan, the plan you chose versus the other plans? Yeah, that's only with the dynamic the, the, because you don't okay. have a dedicated machine. Right. You're getting like potentially scaled up on multiple machines. Oh, okay. And so when I right-click and say attach debugger, it picks a particular instance. As long as the function's not under load, in practice it should only ever run okay. on one particular instance. And I can see that my breakpoint bound as we would expect. So let's go ahead and add something to the queue. Remote debugging. And let's go ahead and push that into the queue. And the breakpoint hit. All right. You can see that we're attached Excellent. remotely. Cool. So I have no idea what happened the first time, but want to just point out we did succeed. Very nice. Um, so, and the message says remote debugging exclamation point. And notice Ooh. that we're running yep. up, up in Azure. So go ahead Sweet. and let that finish.
Now when I refresh, I can see it's gone out of the queue. Stuck to it and proved it. That's right. All right, so that is cool. So Azure Functions, very cool functionality. If you're doing any kind of cloud development, you should definitely look into that. And these tools, uh, in spite of being in the previous state, they work pretty well. We ran into a couple issues, but uh, I, I think they're, they're in decent shape for people to play around with. Yeah, I think so. I mean, half, some of the problems are my own problems. <laughs> Picking the wrong store, changing my storage account, yep. things like that. So, mm -hmm. Cool. All right. Thanks well, so much. Thank you very much. All right. Robert. Hope you enjoyed that. And we will see you next time on Visual Studio Toolbox.